Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, here we go. John chapter 12. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead, there they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, let me tell you something interesting about John, where some of the other Gospels will say, one of the disciples, John usually calls out the name. He does this with Peter several times. And here he says, well, I'm going to tell you who it was. It was Judas. He said, but one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, listen to this. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So John is telling us that Judas Iscariot, the disciple that betrayed Jesus, was really, in a sense, the treasurer of that ministry. And he kept the money box. He kept track of the finances of the ministry. And John said, uh, not only did he have a problem with money, but he would actually steal money from the treasury. Well, I tell you, this has happened and this has been exposed throughout uh, the centuries. And even in recent times, we've seen certain mishandling of ministry money. Well, it, it's horrible. It should never happen. You have to have checks. You have to have balances. You have to have accountability because, uh, as we all know, money is tempting for so many people. So thank God for the ability to have checks and balances. However, even in the ministry of Jesus, this was happening. And what's interesting is Jesus was aware that this was happening and he knew that it was going to come to a head and Judas was going to go off the deep end and actually betray Jesus. Uh, so notice this, verse 7, But Jesus said, Let her alone. Now we're back to this woman. We're back to Mary. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, our siblings, and we're back to Mary now, and she has taken this very, very expensive bottle of oil, this alabaster flask of oil. She's broken this, broken it open. The fragrance fills the whole house. She pours it on his feet. She wipes uh, his feet with her hair. You know the story here. And Jesus says, let her alone. Uh, because they're saying she should not have done that. We, we could have sold this for 300 denarii, nearly a year's wages. This thing, this oil was so expensive. This was like top of the line oil. So expensive. We could have sold that and given to the poor. John said, no, Judas didn't care about the poor. <laughs> he wanted that in the treasury box so that he could, you know, uh, take some of that money for himself. Horrible. So Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. That's not Jesus discounting giving to the poor because Jesus was very much in favor of that. The Bible is very much in favor of that. God very much is pro helping genuine poor people without question. But Jesus is saying, but she's doing something that you won't have an opportunity to do. Once I die, once I'm raised from the dead, once I go back to heaven, you won't have an opportunity to do this, but she's coming at the right time and she's anointing him. And Jesus said, for my burial. Now, whether or not Mary understood all that is not clear. But Jesus said that there's something happening here that's very important to happen right now. And she is giving something uh, very costly. And this really comes back to sacrificing for the Lord, sacrificing to bless him. 
And uh, like he said in, Ma in Mark chapter 10, whoever gives up anything for my sake or the gospels, wife, lands, children, anything, will receive a hundredfold now in this time. So he's saying, listen, God will bless you for it, but there's something about giving for my sake and the gospels. And she's clearly giving for his sake. Verse 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. The miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead may have been the most widespread and famous miracle in Jesus' day that he ever did, raising Lazarus from the dead. It's not the only person he raised from the dead, but it may have become the most widespread and famous. Verse 10, but the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So uh, through the testimony uh, and through the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, and of course, they could corroborate that story because everybody was still alive. Everybody that was there when it happened, everybody that saw him, experienced him being dead, could validate that and say, it happened. No, he was dead. And now look, here he is, talk to him. You know, so I mean, this is an outright uh, evident miracle that can be proven and it has credibility. And because of this, many of the Jews were turning to believe in the Lord. Well, the chief priests hated that. And so they not only hated that people were turning to believe in Jesus and wanted to kill Jesus, but they said, we need to put Lazarus to death too, because his testimony and his life is really giving the ministry of Jesus credibility. Verse 12, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, uh, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out. Now listen to what they said. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Now they're quoting from the 118th Psalm. And this 118th Psalm is a messianic prophecy. In other words, it's a prophecy saying this is what they're going to say when Messiah comes. Now, of course, this is some old roughly a thousand years before Jesus actually shows up that this prophecy is given. Well, they're quoting this prophecy. They're saying this because they're intending to say, we believe this is the Messiah. Now, what's interesting is that prophecy, uh, I don't believe is primarily for the first coming of Jesus, but rather for the second, when he comes in his glory, when he comes in his dominion, when he comes as king and not just as servant and savior. But he comes as King and Lord, Lord of Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and uh, I believe this is a prophecy primarily for that. But it's like uh, hitting two birds with one stone in his first coming. They're also saying that, and guess what? They're right. It's the same person. He is the Messiah, though not ready to to fully establish his kingdom and reign over the earth. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, fear not. And here's another quote from an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, that meant after he was raised from the dead and glorified, when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. So the disciples were walking this out with Jesus, watching these prophecies come to pass, but not connecting the dots that, oh, this is the prophecy of Micah or Isaiah or, or, or Daniel or whoever, right? This is one of those prophecies, the Psalms, David in the Psalms. They didn't connect all those dots at first, but after Jesus was raised from the dead, then they started seeing these prophecies in the scripture and saying, oh, there's another one that happened. There's another one that happened. Can you imagine how cool that would be for them to have these revelations? There it is again. There it is again. And it would further confirm in their hearts. He is the Messiah. There's no way these hundreds of prophecies could have all come to pass in this short span of time uh, of Jesus' life, some 33 years while he was here on the earth without him being the Messiah. The, in fact, I remember one 
in fact, more, more than one, but I know one in particular, Lee Strobel, uh, did some calculations on the mathematical odds that even eight prophecies, eight Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah could all happen in one person. <laughs> and the, the odds were so astronomical that it could ever happen, just eight of the, I mean, hundreds, uh, that he said it's, it's called a mathematical <laughs> impossibility, right? Is it, is it possible one out of, you know, some astronomical number? Well, yes, it is, but it's generally re referred to as a mathematical impossibility. Verse 17, therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of his tomb and raised him from the dead bore witness. See this verse 18. For this reason, the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, that's an exaggeration. That is what they said. So the Bible's true. They did say that. But of course, they're exaggerating their language. But the world has gone after after them. That's the way it felt to them. We're, we're supposed to be the leaders, but the world has gone after him. Now, now there were certain Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, excuse me, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Think about how powerful this is. Jesus is talking about himself, but he's also talking about us. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, in other words, this is as sure as it can be, most assuredly, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Well, he's talking about any seed, right, that you plant into the ground. Uh, if, if you leave it out of the soil, it's just going to be one seed. But if you plant it into the ground and it dies, but it springs up, say, an apple seed into an apple tree full of apples, full of seeds. Now, that one seed that had to die in the soil be broken apart to, from it, uh, an apple tree coming. Now, an unlimited amount of not just apple trees, but orchards around the world can come from that one seed. So Jesus is saying, unless we are willing to give our lives, we will never produce a tremendous multiplication and harvest in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying about himself, I'm willing to die so that this happens, but also implying, are you, are we, are we willing to die? Are we willing to sacrifice our life? He said, he goes on to say, he who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Now, what does he mean hates his life? That doesn't mean I hate my life. That's not a depressive comment. That's saying that the life that I have right now, what I can gain, my retirement, my home, the comfort, the pleasures, and the things that people want out of life. He said, if you're valuing that more than the eternal things, producing the eternal things, reaching people for the Lord and such, he said, if you're loving that, well, you'll lose it. But if you hate it, in other words, in comparison to sacrificing your life to motivate, mobilize people, to win people for the Lord, to win them for eternal life, to see discipleship and the multiplication of the kingdom of God on this earth, he said, then, then you'll gain the eternal life that is really the by far the most important life. So he's talking about himself. He's modeling this for us, but he's also talking to us. Verse 26, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my father will honor. You're either going to serve yourself or money or pleasure or fame, or you're going to serve the Lord, but you can't serve two masters. He said in Matthew chapter 6, 
He goes on to say, Now my soul is troubled, and what I shall say, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He said, I'm being troubled about what's about to happen. He's getting very near now. He's in this final week before he's going to the cross, what's called the Passion Week. And and his, his heart is troubled. He's nervous about this. I mean, he's, he's, he's fighting fear about the torment, the torture, and all of that, the shame of the whole thing. And he said, what am I supposed to say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. So he says, rather, Father, glorify your name. He's not asking for God to deliver him from the shame, the pain, the torture, the torment that he's about to endure. He changes and says, Father, glorify your name. Lord, have me do what you want me to do sacrificially that you may be glorified. Oh, folks, this is not just about Jesus. This is about us. He, he's asking us, will you do the same in your life? Will you give the same sacrifice of your life to the Father that he may be glorified and that Jesus may be glorified? Well, listen to this. He says this. And then it says, then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. <laughs> well, John is a witness. John said, I heard that voice. Uh, verse 29, therefore, the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So not everybody understood what he said. Not everybody understood the voice of Father God. Some people thought that was thunder. Can you imagine what that sounded like? This really happened. Verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, This voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now, now is the judgment of this world. Uh, now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Powerful, powerful concept. Uh, if I'm lifted up, talking about on the cross, I will draw all peoples to myself. The gospel is not the gospel unless Jesus has died for our sins and been raised from the dead. <laughs> this has to happen for there to be a gospel. Otherwise, we're still in our sins. There has been no payment. But Jesus said, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all peoples to myself. And now we've seen all over the world people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus through the gospel of his death and resurrection. Verse 33, this he said, signifying by what death he would die, talking about crucifixion. Verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. And how can you say the son of man must be lifted up? Who is the son of man? See, the Jewish people, they're expecting the Messiah to come, to set up his throne, to dominate the earth, to liberate the Jewish people from the oppression and such, and to forever be here. They didn't understand in the prophecies of the Old Testament that the Messiah would have two comings. First, to pay the penalty for sin and to establish the new covenant. And then some, we know, some 2,000 years later or so, uh, he would come again and fulfill the rest of the messianic prophecies. They didn't understand the two comings. Verse 35, which, by the way, is one of the primary reasons, if not the primary reason, that they discount Jesus as being the Messiah because, well, he didn't fulfill all the prophecies. <laughs> of course, we're not done yet. Verse 35, then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Isn't that interesting? Although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. Always remember, faith does not come by seeing miracles. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's counterintuitive, but it's what the Bible teaches us, and we can see it in people's lives. Somebody may see a miracle, but over time, they'll begin to question, did that really happen? Uh, could it have been 
Could this have been an explanation for why it happened or that, as opposed to it being a miracle from God? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more you hear a story, the more you hear a narrative, the more you believe it, even if it's not true. But if you keep hearing the truth of God's word over and over, the more you believe the truth of God's word. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Okay, verse 38. Well, let me read these together because they go together. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. If people would understand, if people would believe and turn to the Lord, then the promises will come to pass, including healing, salvation, deliverance and such. Verse 41, these things Isaiah said when he saw the glory and spoke of him. So this would be the sixth chapter of Isaiah. Do you remember in the, in the year that King Uzziah died? Uh, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Just a, a magnificent vision that the prophet Isaiah had in, in Isaiah 6. Verse 42, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Listen to this. A lot of Jews believed, and but they wouldn't speak up and say they believed because they were afraid that the religious rulers who did not want them to believe uh, would put them out of the synagogue, and so they didn't want the persecution. How many believers today that do believe in Jesus avoid persecution? And so they don't speak up, they don't, they're not open about their faith, and they avoid persecution. And notice that the Bible says here, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. See, God will praise you when you stand for his truth, even if people curse you. But they they wanted men to, to praise them and to believe that they were in agreement with them. Verse 44, then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Isn't that a powerful statement? I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. In the second coming, he will come to judge the world. But in this coming, he came to save the world so that everybody has a chance for salvation and to be on the right side of judgment. Verse 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. We're going to close with this powerful teaching from Jesus. He who rejects me and does not receive, watch, my words, and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Isn't that interesting? The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. End of chapter. Okay, so Jesus is saying, you know what's going to judge you at the last day? What I've said. So that's why being in God's word, knowing God's word, knowing what's on the test is of utmost importance to us. This We're going to be judged based on what God said, not based on what you think or I think or they think or experts think or scholars think. Uh, -uh. What does the word say? What does it actually say? Jesus said, this is what you're going to be judged on. <laughs> what did I say? What does the word of God say? And so oh, I, I tell you, I, I'll bet you're glad you're <laughs> doing what you're doing right now and staying in the word of God. Well, that's chapter 12. I'll see you tomorrow for chapter 13.